Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and it is uh, Extra Innings with Guy Talk, which means another full hour. So any question you have, send it over, 877-933-2484. Contestant number one, enter and sign in, please. What is your name? Greg Borgon. All right. Contestant number two. Tom Pirish. All right. And three? Jeff Verdorn. Nice pause, Jeff. (laughs) (laughs) I learned that from you. I figured. I figured. So... All right, here's the first question that's come in. End times and last days, are they the same or different, and how so? Good question. The the last days are actually described in Scripture as this age that we are in. We're actually biblically in the last days. This is the last age, but when we use that term, last days or the end times, generally what is being spoken about is God's prophetic plan for the end of the age, which includes a whole series of stuff, which a lot of the details is in the book of Revelation. So while biblically we are technically in the quote-unquote last days, if you hear that phrase, especially if it's the the latter verse uh, phrase that he used, end, end days or end times, that's typically future events that haven't yet come upon the world. Jeff, do you, do you think that the enemy is upping his game because he knows we're in the last days, that his intensity and all that he's doing around the world seems to be intensified of late? You know, there's a in Revelation 12, there's actually an in- interesting passage. Now, this is during the tribulation, mm-hmm. but it says that Satan was enraged and he went after the the woman, meaning Israel, during the tribulation period, because he knew that his time was short. Uh-huh. Does yeah. he know the word of God? Does does Satan understand God's prophetic plan for the end of the age? Yes, he does. Now, he doesn't know when the end times is going to start, right? He doesn't know that. But, man, it sure seems like the stage is being set around the world for this time to come right. upon the world. Yeah, I feel like myself. I have two comments to go with this. First of all, I want to say... If anybody has a chart on the end times, it's Jeff. I have never seen so many good charts, and I mean that all my life. And I keep telling him, laminate them for me. They're wonderful. But I appreciate that. But here's the other thing, because I run into this all the time. I get a lot of these questions. And the two conclusions I've come to is this. Okay, first of all, I can summarize the book of Revelation in two words. Jesus wins. I mean, that's the (laughs) bottom line, the whole thing. Second thing is this. This is the only day you and I have, folks. We have no guarantee we're going to be here for the tribulation yeah, or we're going right. to be here for the rapture. You know, we will be taken with the Lord. But we this is the only day we've got. So you live today to the fullest, being the disciple of Jesus and making as many disciples as you can. And if this is the day the Lord returns, praise God. But if it isn't, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. The only thing I have budget for lamination is I have <laughs> budget allowed to laminate a picture of a, of a slice of pizza to give to Greg. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a that's as close as I'm ever going to get to it. It's obvious get. to me. Yep, yep, yep. I yep. love it. All right. In this passage, John 20, verse 22, Jesus breathes on the disciples and gave them the Holy Spirit. How does this differ from when the disciples received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? Great question. This is one of those, it's like, why why the breath why the breathing what and doesn't the holy spirit come at pentecost to those who are born again um this is you know i this is one of those passages that and and, and i've tried to understand it uh, i've read a number of commentaries on it I, I don't know why he breathes on them and what it truly means to receive the holy spirit because i see the new testament chronology is that christ dies He's buried, he rises again, and he says, wait in Jerusalem before he goes up to heaven because the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And then when it does, at Pentecost, that is when the disciples are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit that is promised by God. 
and the church age starts. And everyone who believes after that receives the Holy Spirit when they believe. So unless you guys have some, this is this is one that I've read a dozen commentaries on this passage, and I don't like really any of them. Have you to read be mine yet? No, I haven't. You I haven't, got an answer I haven't to this? written it either. I can't <laughs> wait to hear what uh, what what the answer is for this because I've struggled what with I this see passage. Is, is this? Yes, the Holy Spirit came in power on the day of Pentecost. In this passage, the risen Jesus is saying, "The power of the Holy Spirit comes from me." I am the author even of the Spirit because he breathed on them. In other words, you look at the you look at Genesis. What did the Lord do in Genesis? He breathed over the land and everything came to be. Jesus brings the Holy Spirit by who he is as Savior and Lord, and the Holy Spirit was there for the disciples. They had no clue how to put that Holy Spirit to work until the day of Pentecost. And then it was kind of, I always look at the day of Pentecost as the Lord going, ay, 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 they've had the Holy Spirit all this time, they're still not doing much. Now we're going to do it with force and power, you know, and the tongues of flame, flames of fire and speaking in different languages. And suddenly everybody's hearing them in a different language. And I think, honestly, if I had been there and one of the disciples, I would have been as surprised as the people hearing what I'm saying because it just came out of the blue. But it's the real power of the Lord. It was always there. It's back right here in the upper room. They had no clue how to use it. But it's not the first time that the word breathe has been used. I mean, in Genesis itself, Genesis chapter uh, 2, verse 5, when no uh, bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant field for the God uh, not cause of rain, he talks about the fact that he breathes in life. In other words, then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's where he imparts his spirit. Yep. into us. That's what makes us different from animals. I totally agree. I get the Genesis account when he breathed into man, and that's when their spirit. they were spiritually alive, but they sinned. They mm-hmm. became spiritually dead. They lost that connection with God, if you will. They've been separated from God. And so when we believe and are saved, that's when we become spiritually alive again, receiving, being united with his spirit. I also agree, Tom, with I, I totally agree with your answer that the Spirit is from him, right. and, and so I see that. But did they receive that rebirth, that mm. being made alive in Christ <clears throat> at this moment? Because in my chronology of the New Testament, that doesn't happen until Acts chapter 2. So I still have a question of what the, all that's true that you guys said. But is that really what is meant here? And, and I've, I this is one of you know, the answer booth in heaven when we get there, you know, I, what did you really mean by that? An exception to the rule. I mean, that God just chose at this, or Jesus just chose at this moment to breathe. Not that it's going to be a common feature for every follower of Christ that they don't receive Christ. Good point. Breathed into them. He just, in this instant, he breathed into them. So theologically, my question is, are they born again here in John 20 or did they become born again in Acts chapter 2? I guess that's my question. Well, what did Thomas say in the upper room when he saw the risen Jesus? Jesus says, touch my hands and my side. What did Jesus say? My Lord and my God. Okay, you can't say that without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so something's going on here. Now, I agree with you. We see the culmination in the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit coming. Mm -hmm. But all along the way, there's evidence of the power there, and Jesus is that power— and when people confess his name, it can only come from the power of the Spirit. I can't confess Jesus without the power of the Spirit in my life. And the Spirit came upon me to confess Jesus long before I ever went looking for Jesus. You know, he was the one who pushed me and brought me to that moment. So it's 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 fuzzy at best. But the point is, the power comes. And as I read that verse, the power comes out of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And the the passage that I was referencing from Acts chapter 1, when his disciples are with Jesus, he's about to go up to heaven, verse 8 then says, says but you will receive power, so yeah. you're, you're on the power aspect of this, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and all the ends of the earth. Yeah. Um, so I see that as the moment that the that the church is born and, and and a person is born again by receiving the spirit in that moment. So, so good question. Yeah, Tom. A couple of minutes ago, when you said God said, "Ay, ay, 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 ay," is that in the Greek or did you just take a, <laughs> did you just take a liberty there? That, that was in Tom's commentary, and it won't be for sale for a long time. Oh, so good. don't worry about it. Let's put that one on ice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. never, never again. <laughs> 
All right, here's a question, gentlemen. When praying to God, I feel like I'm omitting the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, I feel like I'm omitting God. How do I pray without feeling disrespectful? Understand that Jesus is God. The Spirit is God. God is God. We have a triune God. So when we just talked about Thomas, for example, said, my Lord and my God, when he believed. Uh, Jesus said to Philip, when Philip said, show us the Father, he said, haven't you been with me all this time and you still don't know that I am the Father? And uh, so they are one. God has revealed himself in these three persons. I've often hear, heard prayers where the prayer prayer will speak to God, speak to Jesus, speak to the Holy Spirit. I've kind of concluded they're all God, so it really doesn't matter how you address or whom you address it to, if you will. Um, but I have concluded, like the model Jesus gave us, that we pray to the Father through the Son and the power of the Spirit. Yeah. And that's what I've decided. I've often began my prayers with Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, sure. Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And then praying, you know. But here's the one thing I do know. I have three adult sons. You honor any one of my sons and say something good about them. You've honored me. And so I think that we can rest assured in that that's when we great. focus yeah. on Jesus, the Father's happy and so is the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. All right. Well done, gentlemen. So you're not leaving one of them out. No. Right. No. Is, is the answer. All right, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, I will read it. No one who has been born of God practices sin because his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin continually because he has been born of God. The question is, uh, in Romans 7.15, Paul says, I do what I hate. So did Paul have a besetting sin or practice a habit of sinning? When does a bad thing become a habit, and does God continue to forgive habitual sins, as in Romans 7? Ooh, I love this passage. Wow, a lot there. I yeah. think it's, it's if you think of it this way, um, Greg will tell you, Jeff will tell you, I will tell you. We've been reading and studying the Bible and teaching it a long time. There isn't a day that goes by, though, that we don't somehow disappoint the Lord or do or say something we don't want. Where we get in trouble is when we keep doing the same thing over and over and justifying it or finding an excuse to keep doing it without coming back to the Lord and repentance. You know, we've talked about repentance. There's two forms of it. The one when you first come to Jesus to lay down your life to give to him, which mm -hmm. is the big one. And then after you know him, you repent, not to be saved, but because you are saved, now you're giving your repenting to be more like him and to take on his character. So I think what's being said here is this. You know, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Well, I I understand what's being said. I wish John would have added, he could have added, but that he was the writer, goes on sinning without repenting because we all make mistakes. I mean, just driving over here some days, it's not easy on the road to be civil with some of these drivers out there. But the, the moment you fall short, the Christian should be saying, Jesus, I'm sorry, forgive me. Help me to be more like you. So I think that's the the advantage we have, and we should put it to work. When, when we look at the word practice, it means an intentional engagement yeah. of repeated activity. Yeah. So if you're truly saved, it's hard for me to believe that you'll intentionally choose to sin regularly over an extended period of time after having been saved. Good point. There's, there's a number of things, absolutely, by the way, to both of those. <laughs> Throughout 1 John... John goes back and compares and contrasts a believer with an unbeliever. And uh, we can't go through them all, but if anyone claims he's in the light but still hates his brother, for example, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven, that's saved. The unsaved in, in chapter 2, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, that's unsaved. But we love God, that is saved. Back and forth he goes. The one who denies the Son... Uh, doesn't have the father, whoever acknowledged the son has the father. Over and over, about a dozen times leading up to this passage, John is describing someone who is an unbeliever, loves the world, hates his brother, all these things. Now, it doesn't mean, uh, well, hang on, and versus a believer. I think when we get to this in 1 John 3, because we know that if you're a believer, everybody who is a believer 
still sins. Everybody agree? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're but we still do. So it can't be because you're still a sinner, you're not a a believer. But just like John, uh, Paul says in Romans 6, that if you're dead in your sins, you're a slave to sin. But now we've been set free from sin as a believer, uh, Romans 7 says. I think John is picking up on that same language. So when he says, if you're continuing to sin, it's not that we as he's not describing we as believers who continue to sin. We know that happens. I think he's describing an unbeliever in that phrase there. Do you see what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Mm-hmm. And I think that's at the heart of this. And that's why this is a hard verse, because we see ourselves in that verse, but I think he's truly describing an unbeliever in that passage. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, sure does. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a short break, and then we'll be right back with lots more guide talk. If you have a question... We'll do our best to get to it today. A lot of great questions coming in, but yours is important too, 877-933-2484. And if we never get to your question in this allotted time, we put it in a mailbag and we try to pull it out for another episode. Just so you know, we're always trying to answer every question that comes in. So we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. You know, following Jesus is not just something we do. It's who we are. We follow him because he's the savior of the world. He lived, he died, he rose again and blew the doors off of the devil's claim on us. That's why we can live free and we can share with others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right now, it's our spring fundraising season and we would love for you to join the Faith Radio family. Tell others about how God has changed your life. Be an ambassador for Christ as you share the good news. And then, if you feel so led, would you join the Giving Family now? You can do so by clicking on the link in the show notes or simply give safe and secure online at myfaithradio.com. We're back with Guy Talk, or Guys Who Talk. Let me know what questions, 877-933-2484. Here's a question. Uh, The question I asked regarding the tearing of the veil of the temple when Jesus died. What was the response, if any known, by the Jews when they saw and realized this totally supernatural event? Did they deny it happened? Did they sweep it under the rug, so to speak? How could they deny it happened? They must have been blown away. I'm sure they were, yeah. And quite frankly, how do you talk about that? How do you go out and tell the the Jewish people the temple's been ripped in two, that the Holy of Holies is now exposed? And especially when it's right with the the crucifixion of Jesus, who his apostles then were proclaiming is the resurrection, the life a few days later. So I'm sure that they kept it on a low key and, and dealt with it there and You know, the scribes were taken, their pens were taken away from them. They couldn't write this down, the story of what happened. It's just gone. Yeah, I don't know of any historical account that describes what they actually did. Did they repair it? Did they put it back together? What did they do? Um, Remember, the Holy of Holies in that second temple did not uh, have the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was taken out of the first temple, probably when the Babylonians came. They haven't found it since. Also, And so that you, you say, well, the, the Holy of Holies was exposed. Yes, it would have been. And it's a powerful picture of God showing there's a new way to God. It's no longer right. through the sacrifice to come before him. It's now through faith. Um, also remember that that temple only stood for a a number, a few more years after that. By 70 AD, the entire temple is destroyed, and I think the next temple of God to stand is us, the church. We are now the temple of God. Everything except the Western Wall. (laughs) Right? Yeah, Yeah, they're right. The, The only thing that remains... Of the Temple Mount is the mount itself, the foundation wall yeah. that surrounds and makes up the Temple Mount. And the only two structures on it is the Dome of the Rock, which was built by the Muslims in about the 600, 600 yeah. AD. And there's also a mosque, Al- Al-Asqua Mosque, that's on the Temple Mount as well. So no temple. When, when somebody chooses to not believe the truth, that they are unbeliever, you could see a curtain ripped, and you're going to rationalize what happened. Right. Well, it was the storm. It was just a it's series just of earthquake. events because it justifies your already decision that you've made, that you choose not to believe something supernatural just happened. I don't, I can't 
prove this biblically, but you think about it. The Jewish leadership understood that the Lord's presence was in the temple behind that veil there in the, the Holy of Holies. We often think of it being torn in two, you know, symbolizing or that Jesus is torn in two, which he has. But I think the real message is, is that God the Father's out of there, and he's now with his people. He's out among us. He's not confined behind a wall anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's where I, I think it's so powerful to realize that the Lord is among us, and the kingdom of God is within us. And I don't think most Christians understand that. You know, they, they just see themselves still as people. No, the kingdom of God is within you. You represent the Lord. Yeah. Well, the temple, in the, the veil in the temple, when it was ripped from top to bottom, and the high priest would only be in there one day out of the year. Yep. So I assume there was no one in there when it ripped, I'm guessing. Correct. How would you identify a torn veil as it having ripped from top to bottom? I don't want to overthink this, but just yeah, the thought across my mind. Scripture says that it was torn from top to bottom, so I, I don't know if we're getting uh, a, an eyewitness account or not. Remember, the priests would have come in daily into the holy of holy place, the right. first room, right. to do the bread and the altar and the— uh, Where the, the curtain was for the holy of Correct. This yeah. curtain that was ripped from was then the curtain into the next room, which would be the holy of holies. And uh, Tom, as you said, I don't think the presence of God was in that temple. No. There's a very powerful description of God coming into the first temple and his presence coming into the Holy of Holies, which then I think it's Ezekiel 10, help me out guys, where the presence of God, because Israel has forgotten about God, mm-hmm. it lifts up from the temple, goes across the Kidron Valley, and then up from the Mount of Olives. And God says, well, if you're going to ignore me, I'm going to take my presence out of that first temple. That temple is then destroyed. When they return from Babylon, the next temple is rebuilt. There's no similar description of God's presence ever coming into that second temple. You're right. I don't know of anything Yeah, that says that. All right. Nicely done, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, let's see. I just had a question I wanted to get to because this one came in in the first hour. And here it is. I've always wondered, did Jesus have nieces and nephews? His brothers are mentioned in the Bible, and I assume they're married and had children, as most Jews did in that time. Is there anyone that has tried to study the lineage of his family like that? Is that, is that available? I'm not aware of anything. I'm not no. either. Along that line? Now, I'm sure he would have. I mean, sure. it, you have to get past whether or not Jesus actually had brothers and sisters from Mary and Joseph. Uh, there are some traditions that say that uh, there w- Mary never had any other children. I think the Bible uh, seems to make it clear that yes. she actually did have other yeah. siblings um, or children, I guess, from Mary. And I'm. It, it, we actually don't hear about Joseph either, which is kind of one of these stories. Yeah. Why don't we hear from Joseph anymore? I'm going to look him up. Yeah. But if he did, then he would have had an extended family as well if they would have married and had children, which would have been very common. So, yes, um, you know, I'm sure there's somebody walking around, you know, my my, my uncle is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was always that guy, even in the first century. Oh, yeah. Like, that there tells was. me the validity if of the word of God. you knew who my uncle was. <laughs> is that you have James, the half-brother of Jesus, and you have Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. They're both mentioned in the scriptures. Jude actually wrote. And, and girls are mentioned. Oh, yeah. yeah they're, it's there. But can you imagine growing up in that household? I mean, think about it for a minute. The minute, if I was Jude and I did something wrong, how many times did Joseph or Mary say, why can't you be like your big brother Jesus? <laughs> and so the, the, the point of it is you look at families and that creates resentment among people. You don't see resentment in these guys. They are saying, hey, our older brother is God among us. He's Savior. To me, that absolutely blows me away mm. as a legitimate statement of the authenticity of the Bible. Mm. All right. In the tares parable explained in Matthew 13, Jesus said that the tares will be harvested first and burned and the wheat will be collected up into the barn. Would this parable mean the rapture won't happen until the tribulations have already begun? Because if the bad are harvested first, who are the tribulations for? This is, that's a, Great question. There's actually a number of parables. I love this. There's a number of parables in Matthew where there's a separation 
uh, the wheat and the tares, the good fish, the bad fish, the wise virgin, virgins and the foolish foolish virgins. And there is a uh, a tendency for the church to want to see the rapture in these parables. But there's a and, and which the rapture is a a separation if you will, of the righteous from the unrighteous, those who are left behind and those who are caught up, right? Okay, so it's a separation. But there's actually another separation described in Scripture, and that is in Matthew 25, and it's called the sheep and the goat judgment. The sheep and the goat judgment is where he puts the sheep on his right, who are the righteous, the believers, and the goats on on the left. The goats go away where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The, The sheep enter into the kingdom. I think that's an actual event which occurs when Jesus comes. In fact, that whole passage says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will separate the sheep from the goats. I think these parables that precede that description of the sheep and the goat judgment are parable pictures of the sheep and the goat judgment and not the rapture of the church. If you look at it in those lines, uh, with those eyes, I think the parables make a lot more sense. I don't think the rapture is in view, in other words, in the wheat and the tares. I think what is in view is the separation that happens at the sheep and the goat judgment. Bill, just for clarification on the previous question, Mark 6, 3 talks about the fact, is he not the carpenter of the son of Mary and the brother of James, Jonas, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? There you go. So there are at least seven in the family of Joseph and Mary. Mm -hmm. All right, here's another question. And once again, Jeff, I'm looking your direction. Not to pick on you, Mm. but it's it's a rapture question. (laughs) (laughs) He's the rapture guy? (laughs) Yeah. Rapture versus Jesus is the true Israel and land no longer matters, my friend teaches. Not replacement theology, but... Fulfillment theology, he calls it. All of the land and the Jews were used to point to Jesus, and now the land is like any other land. The covenant was unconditional to keep the bloodline going until Jesus fulfilled, and he is the true Israel. I've been trying to discern this for weeks. Well, call it whatever you want, spiritual fulfillment or replacement theology, um, it's it's all the same, and it's this idea that many in the church have. This is an interpretation difference uh, that that there is out there of whether or not God still has a plan for Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some say that no, God is done. Jesus fulfilled everything, and we are now spiritual Israel. The church is now spiritual Israel, and God's done. With Israel, there's no future for them. Others say, well, yes, Jesus is the fulfillment of all those things, as you say, but it's still true that God made an unconditional promise Mm -hmm. to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that your descendants would possess the land forever. I read that contextually and say God is speaking of the the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we see it actually in the New Testament. And for example, in Romans 11, 26 says, there's a day coming, and I think it's in the end times, when Israel will be saved. They will look upon him Mm -hmm. whom they have pierced and they will mourn. They will finally recognize their Messiah. So Jesus is the spiritual fulfillment of all those promises. But God clearly said that Israel will never cease to be a nation before him. And he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that their descendants would possess the land forever. I believe that. Okay. We'll take a break and be right back. So don't go anywhere. 877-933-2484 for whatever question you have for Guy Talk. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time, let's get it started. Jump in your car, what's for dinner? It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Maybe you're having dinner in your car. Maybe it's a one-and-done activity. Works for me. You've eaten in your car before, haven't you, Tom? Many times. Really? Yeah. Are you driving when you're eating? 
<laughs> I'm obeying oh, the law. Okay. I'm very careful. We call that gray area. Yeah. Yeah, it is gray. Yeah. All right. I'm not to pick on you, Jeff Dorn, but here comes another question. Your direction. Hmm. When the rapture happens, isn't it true that the Holy Spirit will depart the earth since the Holy Spirit lives in the hearts of believers and they will all be gone? How can non-believers after the rapture be saved? Yeah, so there's actually a passage in Second Thessalonians that talks about uh, the restrainer or the restraining force being removed. And there's kind of a theological debate. Is that the church or is that the Holy Spirit? And in my opinion, the church is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And if the church is raptured, then this, this force for good, uh, this light in this world is taken away. It's taken up. Um, but while the, the Spirit is indwelling the church and, and will depart, that restraining force for good will be removed, it does not mean that if you believe during the tribulation, you don't receive the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus right. made a promise yep. that after his death, burial, and resurrection, you would receive the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and he would be with you forever. That promise is still stands even after the church, which is a force for light in this world filled by the Holy Spirit, is removed after the rapture. Well done. All right, gentlemen, if you could go back in time to listen to a sermon given by one of the great preachers or missionaries, who would it be and why? Hmm. A great question. Oh. For me, it would be A.W. Tozer. Um, he was so profound in his understanding of Scripture, but made it so easily understood. And all the books I've read that he's either written or been written about him, um, I just would love to go ahead and just listen to his sermons. Read. I'd like to sit down with C.S. Lewis and go through mere Christianity, you know, chapter yeah. by chapter, and just talk about it with him because I referred back to that book probably more as often as I have the Bible and sometimes. It's phenomenal what he said in there. I had the privilege of actually staying in C.S. Lewis's home when I wrote one of my books, and they had um, uh, transcripts of three radio series that he did that ultimately became the book Mere Christianity no right kidding. there at the, at wow. the house. Can I, can I touch your shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you here. I, I don't, I don't have an answer. I can't, I'm there. There's a, I mean, I've read a lot of old Christian sermons and, um, have gleaned much from them over the years. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't come up with a favorite. Jeff, you've seen my sermons on YouTube. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You're missing an opportunity here. Which one would it be for you, Bill? Uh, it'd probably be a uh, George Whitfield or a... I, I'd be really curious to hear Charles Spurgeon Me too. Preach. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing Luther. Well, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> be cool. Yeah. What he experienced? Yeah. Okay, I, I got one. Who? But it's not specifically a preacher. Horatio Spatford. Okay. Do you guys oh, know yeah. the story? Yeah. Oh, sure. Very, very familiar. So a Chicago <laughs> business guy <laughs> who who was the guy who wrote It Is Well With My Soul. Mm-hmm. Yes. One of the greatest hymns ever written. And if you know the story, he sent his family to Europe ahead of him. The ship went down and he lost his children. I think it was three children, if yes. I'm not mistaken. His wife survived. She sent a telegram back to him arrived stop alone Oof. when he was then finally went to europe after to go meet his wife the captain of the ship said sir this is the spot where the ship went down and you lost your children and that's when he penned the words wow. it is well with my soul wow. as sea billows roll yeah and that it is well it is well with my soul and and probably the great can i do this the probably the greatest line in any hymn ever my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but in whole. It is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. It is well, it is well with my soul. It's great. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you for that, Jeff Fordorn. All right, here's a question, and Greg B., I'm looking your direction on this one. After you sin, the same sin, are you working, uh, you, you are working to overcome come. Do you say the sinner's prayer each time? Confession for a believer uh, is different than confession for somebody that's going to be converted. In other words, that's going to receive Jesus for the first time. 
in confession for a believer, you're acknowledging what Christ has already done. Mm-hmm. You're acknowledging the fact that your sin sent Jesus to the cross, and you're grateful for that forgiveness. And you appropriate it again, and you ask God to give you the strength to live um, and to honor the family uh, of, of God. And so oftentimes the reason why we repeat sin, we don't take the second step. Removal is through confession, but whatever is created as a void needs to be replaced with something which is the truth. Then you act on the truth in the same direction over an extended period of time and ultimately will have victory because you've replaced the void with truth. Good word. Nice word. All right. Thank you for that, Greg B. Here's a question. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Do you know what Jesus means here in Matthew 16? Tom, I think this is what you were describing earlier, that when we proclaim God's forgiveness, it's not us doing the forgiving, but we're proclaiming the biblical truth that you have been forgiven. Yeah. I think this passage is is in that same yep. vein, don't you think? Yes, I do. Yeah, I it's look, there is no inherent power in me. The only power I have is because I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ when the Holy Spirit woke me up. But out of that, the New Testament tells me I am his body in the world. I get to be his voice in many situations. You know, I get to be his presence. I am his ambassador. I'm a minister of reconciliation. And I don't think we've examined that deeply enough in the church to help Christians understand that if you want to use the term authority, um, I, I could tell my congregation, look, as both believers in Jesus Christ and as Americans, you have the authority and the right to go to school board meetings that are out of line and to speak up in Jesus' name for the truth. You have a right to go to your government. You have a right to go in your church and speak up if there's something out of line. But most of us don't understand that. And we're always looking for a leader, somebody to step in, to take care of that for us. Mm -hmm. When the reality is Jesus has chosen his church, the believers, as the real ambassadors of the gospel, not some specialized individual uh, out there that's going to pronounce the truth. He's called us. He's empowered us. And he's equipped us. Yes. So he's Mm -hmm. given this mission, and then it's his power that's working in us, just as you described. What's that passage in Ephesians where it says, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us? For some unfathomable reason, infinite God has chosen us as his finite creatures to facilitate his redemptive purposes in a fallen world. Go figure, because we wouldn't have chose us. I wouldn't have chose me. (laughs) But God did, and he works through us. So we are, what you're talking about, Jeff, is we're a conduit for God's grace. We are not the grace. We are a conduit for his grace. And we're imperfect, and we make mistakes. But that's why, really, church leaders especially uh, should be the first ones to repent when they're wrong. But rarely do you ever see a church leader stand up and say, I sinned against you and against the Lord for what I did. Please forgive me. I shared a a little poem. You probably know the poem, you guys. I shared it about the church last Sunday. You know, oh, the joy above with the saints we love. Now that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, now that's another story. (laughs) Because this is where the challenge is in Christianity. The challenge is I can't claim to love Jesus if I'm not willing now to invest my life in loving you, a fellow believer. Mm-hmm. All right. Here's a last question before we go to break. Acts two twenty one. Can you explain what it means? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is calls? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. What is calls? Well, I think there's a number of ways that faith is described in Scripture. Um, you know, he told the woman at the well, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for living water, right? So that's the way it's described. If you call on me, if you repent, if you turn from the world, if you believe, if you have faith, um, I think there's a number of ways that if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we talked about that last week, uh, actually, uh, receiving the Lord, whoever receives uh, me, I will give them uh, eternal life. And and so it's described many ways. I think it's just a simple picture of salvation. If you turn to God in faith, 
God will save you. All right, we'll take a break and come right back with more Guide Talk. Thanks for listening uh, today. We're going to have time for a few more questions. If you have one, send it over, 877-933-2484. My panel today is Greg B., Tom P., Jeff V. That's the team. We'll be right back. If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. We're back with more guy Talk. I've got interesting question popped in here. I have four grandkids, two boys, two girls, and they're entering high school. And they just started to date. <laughs> Can the guys recommend any Bible-centered Christian books that they could use as a guide when entering that dating world? Yeah, it there is. are a ton of them out there, and, and I've touched on a lot of them. In the early days, I would have talked about James Dobson. He had some very good books on this, uh, about dating. Uh, there has been a whole series that have come afterward on this. Basically, what it comes down to is it's the basic advice is tell your kids that they have two choices in life, or they actually have to do two things. One, you know, talk to Jesus about dating. Talk to Jesus about your future. Talk to Jesus about where you're going. And second, have the ability to think through your behavior and how it's going to affect you the rest of your life. Because I don't think most kids do. Mm-mm. They don't think in those terms. One of the uh, the good things the Lord did to me when I was dating, uh, because I, I had uh, two of my siblings uh, had children out of wedlock. And by the time I came along, I was the youngest and not that I, I was very interested in girls like every other guy back in the late 60s and that. But the Lord impressed on my heart, Tom, you better be sure that if you're going to to be inappropriate and a young woman gets pregnant, that you will love her and serve her the rest of your life. And, you know, and, it, and it immediately, oh. immediately at that point, I began to think, wait a minute, you know, I don't... For five minutes of fun, am I going to spend the rest of my life being committed to this person? And by God's grace, you know, he kept me out of trouble. And by God's grace, I met my wife. Hmm. That's a great, I'm going to have to, can I use that? <laughs> Please. <laughs> That's good. You guys talk after the show, all right? <laughs> <laughs> have your little private conversations after the show. All right, I asked Jesus to heal me. I felt his love uh, come over me, just like a miracle. I struggle to let myself stay healed. Does Jesus take back his healing? Am I not accepting the gift like the man at the pool who had to stand? Hmm. I don't know of a biblical example where he took back a healing. So I I can't go there. I would think in this person's situation, uh, my counsel as a pastor would be keep going back to the Lord, you know, and saying this is back or this is happening or this is going on. And as he touched you once, he may want to touch you again. But regardless of what he does, you know, Jesus will have the final word in your life, and that's who you trust. I'm I'm going to make an assumption in this question that we're not talking about physical healing here. Right. All right? Now, I don't know if that's accurate or not. I'm just kind of gleaning that from the question. Okay. But if it's not physical, Jesus never takes back his healing. All right? It no. just doesn't happen. So, but what I, what I sense in this question, and I might be wrong, is that there he was healed from something, he or she was healed from something in their life, maybe a sin or something, and this healing came, and maybe that's being returned. And I would I would submit that it's not a question of Jesus taking back the healing. Uh, I would submit that maybe this person is returning to some of the things of the world. And I, yeah. I'm seeing that in this question because Jesus doesn't take back healing, period. So, and, and if he heals, it doesn't mean, and by the way, we, whenever I talk about healing, I, I like to talk about that the greatest healing of all that Jesus does, and by the way, he never takes this back either, is salvation. Yeah, He's sure. healed us from the greatest disease of all, and that is sin and death. And right. that is the biggest healing of all. There is no way to walk through this world and not be impacted by it physically, emotionally, spiritually, requiring Christ to heal us more than once. But I agree with you. He doesn't take the healing back. No. It may be a different set of a different set of circumstances that we're dealing with that are related to what we struggled with before. But God heals 
at that moment. And it's a continual process because we walk through a fallen world. It is. So God says, continue to put off that old self. Yeah. Right? To, to keep in step with the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. These are the kinds of actions and activities that God kind of exhorts us to are all in, in, in the Greek, in the continuing aorist tense uh, in voice that basically says, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. I often go on the Internet just looking for stories, uh, true Christian stories. Well, there are now a plethora of sermons on there. You go on there, there's tons that you can, and everybody has a price to buy into it. That's fine. I understand that you need to make a living. But what's interesting, I have never found a single sermon on a four-week series on, you know, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart of overcome the world. Mm-hmm. Because we don't want to think that when we follow Jesus, we're going to have trouble in this world. We want to think that we're somehow exempt. And that's a popular theology, and there's a lot of people that gather around that. The point is, Jesus is saying, even when you come to me, this life has got its ups and downs and can be very difficult. But in the midst of that, never give up on me or what I've got for you. And and if I'm if I'm right that this is not physical healing, you know, this person is now experiencing some of those things in the world that you just described, Tom. And by the way, every Christian experiences that. Yep. Every single Christian. Mm-hmm. No temptation has come to any of us that is not common to man. Um, but so, so you know, being healed from it again and again, turning from it again and again, and the wonderful promise in Scripture, flee from these things, and the devil, the tempter, will flee from you. Yeah, we like to believe that receiving Jesus as Savior is a one-time event, but because we live in this world, because we suffer the consequences of bad decisions and habits that have to be replaced by God's grace— that we need a Savior every single day. Of course. It has nothing to do with eternal security. Correct. It has everything to do with our dependence on the Lord until we're taken from this world. I die daily. Yeah. All right. Gentlemen, uh, I assume heaven is filled with very godly souls and saints. And so what, what does it mean to want intercessory prayer for people in heaven? Saints, godly people, can you ask them to, can you pray to them? Can you ask them to pray on your behalf? Can you say to them, would you be an intercessor on my behalf? Scripture is clear that says there's one mediator between heaven and us, and that's Jesus Christ. I don't know of anything in Scripture uh, that gives us that permission to call on the saints or anybody else. Uh, I think that's heavy in some church traditions, but I don't know anywhere in Scripture, and if anybody knows it, I'd like to see it. Mm-hmm. No, God said, worship me alone. He hears our prayers. Uh, and as you said, uh, Greg, that, that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. He's your access to the throne of God. It's through his blood. So go through him. There is no other God. No other God. Yeah, and why would you go to anybody else except the one that always hits a home run when he goes up to the bat? You know, so Jesus is the one. Go to him. Yeah. Mm. But there are things that people have learned. There are things that, that they cling to. How do we um, impress upon them that there is only one mediator between God and man? Well, the, the only source we have really is the Word of God. We have to keep coming back to the Word of God to bring clarity to the confusion that we might have. And so we have to rely on the Word of God for the truth so that we can, you know, walk in this darkness. It's it's the old Billy Graham. The Bible says. (laughs) (laughs) We talked about that earlier. We did. did. Your understanding of the Bible says. Yeah, but in this one, then we're going to quote the Scripture. And you, uh, uh, Greg, uh, quoted it earlier. There's one mediator between God and men. Often I challenge people. When I hear something like this in counseling or in church or a meeting, I will literally say to that person, hey, I know that you're somebody that explores and likes to look into things. How about if you take a six-month hiatus from praying to anybody else and only pray to Jesus, asking him to fulfill your answers? Then let's talk about it in six months. Now, do I get people to do that? Well, not a whole lot. But those that I have have always come back to me and said, yeah, why wasn't I doing this all Mm, the time? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with remembering your leaders who spoke the word of truth to you and who have gone before you and to honor them and to to model your life after them. That's what Hebrews 13, 7. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for another robust couple hours of Guide Talk. 
thank you for all the great questions that have come in. That's all the time we have. I don't know what awaits you this evening, but I really pray that you have a wonderful time with family and the Lord, and I hope you have a great night's sleep. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.